Hello, hello everyone. Good evening and welcome to another An Evening With. And today we have Goiko. Goiko Adzic, welcome. How are you? Excellent, thank you. Ciao, good to see you again. Last time we saw Goiko was in Milan in the autumn of 2019. Then we all know what happened, but we are very happy to have him with us again for this meetup and also at a workshop in July. But we will talk about it later. Uh, so not uh, much I can say about Goiko other than he's a celebrity in the IT world. He's written books like uh, Impact Mapping. We are talking. Uh, we are going to talk about impact mapping, as you can see uh, this evening, and specification by example, and also some on serverless. Um, so we are here today for this meetup on impact mapping. As I, as I said, uh, you have a chance to ask questions to Goiko and to other folks in the chat by using the YouTube chat that you, that you see here. Uh, so feel free to type your questions anytime, and uh, at some points we are going to stop, and also at the end of the talk we will stop and uh, so that I can read the questions to Goiko. Um, I think that's it. So Goiko, over to you. Oh, thank you very much, and uh, welcome everybody. I can see a few of my friends have joined, at least according to the chat, so hello to everybody. And uh, today, I'm going to talk a bit about facilitating impact mapping. Um, impact mapping is a collaborative planning uh, technique that helps organizations get a quick alignment on what they want to build and what, what where the value is and how to track delivery. Uh, impact maps usually look like this, and they're mind maps that uh, take us from deliverables all the way to business goals and allow us to make sure that what we're delivering actually is creating an impact and to prioritize things hierarchically. And um, I've been uh, researching impact mapping for a long time now. I stumbled upon impact mapping in 2010 at a conference, and I've been fascinated uh, by, uh, with, with this since. And for the last two years, a friend of mine from Vienna called Christian Hassa and I have been interviewing uh, organizations on how they facilitate impact mapping to get most out of these sessions and, and to create the best maps to get the most value out of their product. And we are now going into kind of the second phase of the research, which means that we've collected lots and lots of case studies and we think we have identified some interesting patterns. And I'm going to kind of give you some data about that and some tips on how to facilitate in different situations. But we are now uh, collecting much, much wider data. So currently we have an ongoing survey uh, where we hope to get at least a few thousand people responding to see if the patterns that we think emerged from our research actually exist. And if you have used impact mapping before, um, either you know for a good result or a bad result and um, you want to contribute to this I would really really appreciate it uh, send me an email I'm very easy to find online goiko at goiko.com or goiko at goiko.net I'll send you the link to the survey I would appreciate it very very much so kind of um, on to the conclusions um, based on the data we have so far we, we think there's three a big, uh, important, different contexts where and how people use impact mapping and that facilitating e impact mapping is different in these three different contexts. So it's really worth thinking about what you want to get out of it and um, to know when and who to prepare and, and how much to prepare. So the first big context that we think kind of exists there is where people have uh, known objectives, where people know what objectives are for an initiative or a project, but there's just lots of objectives. And uh, you can't really do everything, of course, and trying to do too many things at the same time means that everything gets delayed. And in these situations, lots of organizations have used impact maps to focus delivery, to really choose what to do now, what to postpone for later, and to track what they're doing to make sure that they're achieving um, big results quickly. So um, 
what turns out to be really important in this context is not to try to agree on a goal during an impact mapping session to have a goal prepared up front and to start with a single goal. We've heard lots of stories where in a situation like this, people bring really senior stakeholders to the room. You know, they, they fly directors from all over the world into the same room. This costs a lot of money. They promise an excellent result. And everybody's enthusiastic only to spend like the whole day arguing what should be the goal. So they don't even start doing impact mapping properly and everybody's kind of a bit disappointed at the end. So if you have lots of objectives, if you know what the objectives are, then what's really important before you jump into an impact mapping session, get senior stakeholders to agree on a goal. Um, I usually suggest like doing this a week or even two weeks before the actual impact mapping session where um, you use something else uh, like uh, pr prioritization of voting or get somebody to kind of start drafting some kind of political agreement. A very good technique for this is from um, a book called Lean Analytics. They have the stages of growth technique. There's other ways to set the goal, but really choosing one goal up front. And then um, get the delivery team and the stakeholders to map uh, and create this map together. Um, what turns out to be an important difference in, in this way of working to other types of impact maps is that it's best to keep only to very, very high level deliverables, um, not to have like uh, low level stories or smaller epics, but keep deliverables on the maps that are, you know, weeks of work or even months of work. And it turns out in this context, it's really, 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 really important to have Intra reasonable metrics on the level of impacts, on the level of behavior changes. The reason why this is so important is to be able to focus the delivery as we work. So um, once you choose an impact, you do something for two weeks or a month, and then you go back to the map and then review this and say, we are going the right direction, we're not going the right direction, we can drop the rest of this section because we delivered or we have to kind of replan this. And uh, impact metrics tend to be really, really good for this. Metrics around the goal, not so much, because metrics around the goal tell you six months later whether you've achieved what you wanted or not. And again, reviewing these impact metrics during delivery becomes really, really important. So on the topic of setting a goal, we've had lots of really interesting uh, techniques to try to get stakeholders to choose one goal. One of the techniques we've heard from a very, very, very large global software uh, company uh, is that they got all the stakeholders into the room and they gave them sticky notes to individually write what they think is the most important goal. And out of uh, 20 stakeholders in the room, they got something like 30 most important goals. And then everybody realized that it's kind of pointless to try to deliver 30 things at once, but started really thinking about, well, can we group these somehow? Can we refine them and then chose one goal? So if you're getting uh, in a situation where there's lots of different potential objectives, um, try to get senior stakeholders to write the goal individually and then kind of compare. That really helps a lot. Another really important facilitation tip um, in this, but also in other cases, is once you start doing an impact map, um, the, the structure of the impact map is kind of the business goal, then the actors, who's going to be impacted or who can contribute to the goal, who can uh, kind of disrupt it, and then the impacts on these actors and then the deliverables. And lots and lots of people told us in the research that kind of they stuck when they start doing actors. They um, set up, you know, they explain the goal, then they start thinking about, well, who can contribute, who can uh, kind of... Uh, or, or make a problem here and then there's just too many actors and the discussion just diverges too much and most of these actors are not even important for that specific milestone so instead of kind of going goal actor impact deliverable when you're facilitating an impact mapping session it turns out it's actually much 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 better to do the goal and then skip the actors work on impacts think about well if we could change the behavior of these people in some way could we contribute to the goal and what's the change there and collect lots and lots of ideas around impacts and then later group these impacts into actors. Um, a story we heard from a healthcare company that was quite interesting was 
that um, the, the uh, people joining an impact mapping session were trying to break the format all the time. And I see this often when I facilitate sessions as well. The, the people were trying to put deliverables as impact. They were trying to put impacts as goals. There were some even people declaring, oh, a mobile, delivering a mobile platform is a goal, although that's a deliverable. Delivering is in the name, so it can't really be a goal. And um, the facilitator who ran this told us that basically he let people do whatever they want for about half an hour. And then he gave them uh, a 10 minute coffee break. And when everybody was on the break, he kind of restructured the stickies on the board so that they're all aligned in, in different groups. And when people came back from the break, they kind of um, got the structure intuitively and started contributing to individual groups separately. So um, one of the biggest benefits for me uh, for, from the impact mapping structure is that it forces us to think about all these things. Uh, it's very easy to think about deliverables. It's relatively easy to think about business goals. M most organizations I work with don't really have a problem with these two. But the jump from a deliverable to a business goal is huge. And the, the mental jump is huge. The project management jump is huge. A metric jump is huge. Because it's very, very rare that a single user story significantly increases revenue. Or that, um, you know, a single feature creates a massive change in the market share. And for good prioritization, for good discussions, for focusing delivery, we really need this step in between. One of the books I came across researching this thing um, last few years is Four Disciplines of Execution. And I strongly recommend people to read this book if you've not read it so far. Four Disciplines of Execution is, is a book that's wonderfully well written. If you have been doing lean delivery, if you've been doing Kanban, if you've been doing kind of modern software project, product management for a bit, you're probably not going to find anything revolutionary new in the book. But it's still worth reading because it's incredibly well written, which means that they found this wonderful vocabulary, how to explain things that you'll be able to use working with your, your colleagues and your clients. And one of the things they talk about in the book very specifically, it's the second of the four important disciplines of execution, is kind of uh, figuring out the leading metrics and acting on leading metrics. And they say that pretty much all organizations can figure out a year or two years after they finished something if uh, the uh, uh, thing created whatever value it wanted to create. But that's too late to know while you're delivering, should you readjust your plan or not. And organizations that are incredibly good at delivery uh, find good ways of acting on metrics they can measure every week, every two weeks, and, and that will help you find, well, is this particular user story contributing to the bigger goal somehow? That's where the middle of the impact map perfectly works. And in four disciplines of execution, they say that most organizations that they found with successful metrics for um, these leading indicators have two categories of these things. There's only two categories of these things in most cases. One is unblocking a critical blocker. That means um, either kind of uh, creating an opportunity for somebody to do something they were blocked or, or actually completing some critical task. And these things are relatively rare with kind of the, the stuff we do. Um, for example, uh, when GDPR was introduced, having GDPR compliance was a critical blocker. But the, 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 these binary things on off, they're very, very rare. And they said that the second kind of category, much, much more common, are behavior changes, which fits in perfectly with impact maps because an impact mapping kind of middle, the impacts, they're, they're best as behavior changes. So kind of uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, the structure of the impact map is really important because it gets us to think from deliverables to the goals, but kind of this impact part in between really should be about whose behavior needs to change and how. Instead of thinking about, well, whose behavior we change and how, first think about, well, you know, what are some potentially useful behavior changes that contribute to the goal and group into actors. That will help you drive this part much, much faster. Um, so the second um, type of uh, kind of context where impact maps tend to be useful is reframing a problem. Unlike focusing objectives where the, the focusing delivery where objectives are clear, 
but there's just too many of them. Reframing a problem is usually necessary where people don't really have shared objectives or they're unclear. Several cases of this that we've heard, for, for example, where a product project has been going on for a long time and then kind of it's stalled. They've delivered what they were supposed to deliver. Now version two, they're building some new features and it's just kind of a bunch of things. Nobody really knows what's important or what's not important anymore. Another example of this is where there's really complex business knowledge held by a single person or a reference document. And uh, people don't really know what's important or what's not important. Uh, a concrete case example I can give you for this is we spoke to people who were working with one of the European tax authorities. And they had this big initiative that was supposed to um, speed up fraud detection. And they were going to do machine learning. They were going to do artificial intelligence and a lot of other things there. But actually, nobody really knew what or why or, or how this is supposed to work. And after doing impact mapping um, and, and re kind of reframing the problem completely, they realized that it's going to be too difficult to actually kind of do this fraud detection in a better way than humans do. But what the machine can do is the machine can spot where there is no fraud. The machine can eliminate cases that humans don't need to investigate. And actually, as a result of this, they, they saved something like 10 times more money than they expected because people were able to focus on much, much higher priority cases. Anyway, so unlike the focusing uh, delivery uh, where uh, kind of there's a, there's a goal that needs to be agreed up front and then senior stakeholders and delivery people go in a room, it turns out that in this case, because the objectives are not shared, it's much better for a single person to collect information through several meetings with smaller groups. So one person usually drives this stuff and meets with different stakeholders, meets with different groups, collects information, and then kind of presents their conclusion to the stakeholders back. And that's what happened in this case. Somebody actually kind of spent a lot of time talking to different stakeholders and said at the end, look, I think, yes, we thought we were going to do this, but what I actually proposes we do this other thing and then get got people to kind of agree or, or disagree. In this case, again, high-level deliverables only. Um, avoid low-level stuff on the map. Uh, th there's other ways of capturing low-level deliverables, but if you want to present a high-level overview, it's very, very difficult to do that if people have to read 500 things. And unlike focusing delivery, where impact metrics are the ones that are important because they will get revisited frequently, in this case, because it's reframing the problem, the goal metrics are actually more important than impact metrics. And several cases where we've heard people uh, in the focusing delivery context, actually, they didn't ha have any goal metrics. Goals were more visionary and there was something to aspire to. But in, in reframing a problem, that's not enough because we need to be able to say, look, you know, these are the numbers we want to achieve. And if these are the numbers we want to achieve, then actually doing a machine that eliminates kind of uh, cases that detects where there's no fraud is better than a machine that detects where there is fraud. So um, as a, a kind of higher level facilitation tip, this is not just applicable to this case, but to other cases as well. It turns out um, one of the best tips people had for us when we were talking about how they facilitated impact mapping sessions is to show an example map that's very simple from a related context before they start. Now, there's a couple of th th important things here. The first one is the map really has to be simple. You don't want to get people lost in details and, and trying to figure out, well, why is this here? Why is this there? And the other thing that's really important is it needs to be from a related context. We had a couple of case studies where um, they somebody prepared the map that's from the exact same context they were working on. So say somebody's building a mobile application for ticket booking and they actually created a impact map that's an example for ticket booking in a mobile application. Um, although that sounds logical because it should give people even better context, it turns out it's actually preventing a good discussion because everybody who was in the room was too influenced by the example map and then the discussions were not as good as in other cases. And um, when people were showing a related context, that was enough for the stakeholders and everybody who doesn't know what impact maps are to kind of 
get the structure, but not really be too committed to that particular map. And um, the third uh, interesting uh, aspect of where impact maps are useful and, and could be useful is to get a high level alignment. Um, and usually this is where there are no declared goals, uh, where the solutions are prescribed instead of goals. Um, some examples of this that we've heard are uh, replacements, like there's a legacy system, we want a new system, and the new system should work exactly the same as the old system. And there really is no goal there. The goal is to replace the system. Um, another example of where um, these things could, uh, th this is a context in which people are working is external suppliers or external clients. So we spoke to several organizations where they had no software delivered internally. They would kind of create a plan and then hire a software delivery organization. Likewise, we spoke with some software delivery organizations that were hired by external clients. And in cases like this, uh, usually people look for some kind of good alignment on what to do when and a high level plan. Uh, and in many cases, they look for kind of some hidden business value that's really implied but not clear to people there. And um, it turns out it's really, really useful to have a draft of a goal. Um, unlike the um, focusing delivery context where it's important to have a full upfront agreement on a goal, in this case, for an impact mapping session, it's important to just have a draft. Somebody has to have a good idea what the goal could be. And the goal usually gets refined quite a lot in the, in the session. Um, We've had several stories. I'm still not totally convinced on this. And this is one of the parts where I, I, I do want to get more data through this kind of second phase of the research. But from what we've heard so far, it looks like um, getting the key stakeholders to create a map together without people from the delivery team or, or with just you know one or two senior delivery people um, is better than involving lots of people who will actually work on delivery. Because the stories we heard were when lots of people who work on delivery get there, they start solutionizing too quickly. And um, the big value out of the impact mapping session here is actually to refine the goal and to set some high level impacts that they want to work, to actually set a vision. So um, the... the uh, one of the interesting facilitation tricks we've heard for this context as well is to try to avoid discussing deliverables at all. I, that's not always possible, especially if you're working on like-for-like -like replacements or if a client comes and says, this is my shopping list of features. But one potential way of working around this is to very quickly um, try to navigate away from deliverables, to start listing deliverables, identify impacts for those deliverables, and then kind of hide the deliverables or take them off the board. So some examples we've heard were like people were writing deliverables on sticky notes and then grouping them into impacts. And then in order to be able to have more space on the board, they would take off the deliverables and just leave the impacts there. Um, usually, um, the impact map does not survive for a long time after this high-level alignment. What tends to happen is people agree on, okay, that's the actual goal we want, these are the impacts we want, these are the stakeholders we want to impact, and as a result of that, then they create a vision document, a request for proposals, a PowerPoint presentation, something else. Kind of the map really stops becoming important after the session. The structure is useful for that discussion, but that's it. And um, a, a, an interesting tip we've heard from several people where this worked out well is after you've made this kind of vision document with key impacts and, and things you want to achieve, then the delivery team on their own comes up with a proposal. It's kind of something like, okay, the stakeholders have identified these things, the delivery team or the delivery groups comes up with a proposal how they're going to achieve it. And then the stakeholders review and things like that. So again, that's designed to avoid solutionizing, but also designed so that technical experts can have the last word on, on the technical stuff. Otherwise, kind of uh, there's too many features in the plan, and then the plan becomes just ticking off the boxes rather than delivering something important. So th there's another couple of tips. Um, I've promised five important tips in, in the uh, summary for this talk. So the, the uh, fourth important tip is in, in the case of high-level alignment, 
And in the case of um, re restructuring, so not, not in the case of focusing delivery, the direction of an impact matters more than an actual number. What I mean by that is figuring out the change we want to create in somebody's behavior and what's the direction of that change matters more than saying 5, 10, 20%. So kind of to make this a bit more concrete, like consider this story. The, 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 you know, as a risk manager, in order to detect miscategorized payments, I want to have payment alerts or, or something like that. Now, one of the most important questions that they talk about in four disciplines of execution is knowing, are we going in the right direction? That's, that's a fundamental question that we know, we need to know when we're delivering. Um, should we deliver more of this? Should we stop? Should we move on something else? We need to know, are we going the right direction? And if you consider a story like this, a story like this does not actually provide a direction. A story like this talks about the type of work people do, detecting miscategorized payments. It doesn't say anything about the direction in which this thing should change. And because there's no direction here, we, when we do payment alerts, we're not going to be able to know if we've delivered enough, too much, too little, if this is even the right solution for this. Um, and what they talk about in four disciplines of execution is kind of setting up these uh, leading indicators. And a behavior change is a really good leading indicator. So we can talk about, well, are, are the payments alert there so we can detect miscategorized payments more accurately? Or is it that we detect this thing uh, sooner? Or is it that we detect these things maybe faster or something like that? Now, this gives us a direction. And the direction is really, 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 really uh, important here because we, we can measure what people are doing now. How quickly are they detecting these categories payments? We can release payment alerts. And then a week later, we can say, is this going faster or not? Are we even going in the right direction? Now, of course, you know, if you can put a number on it, like 30% faster, that makes it even better. Because then we can say, look, you know, we've delivered payment alerts uh, and we are at... We've delivered 10% of the payment alerts and we're already at 30% faster, so we can drop the other features. Or we can say, look, you wanted 30% faster, we delivered payment alerts, it's only 1% faster. Now, th th there's something weird here. We need to replan, we need to reevaluate what we're doing. So a number is good, but if you cannot get a number there, make sure to at least have a direction. Unless, if you don't have a direction, you will never be able to use something like this for a leading indicator. And again, impact maps come really, really well here because the middle of an impact map is supposed to be a behavior change. So uh, probably one of the biggest problems with impact maps that people have where they don't really get the value out of it is the middle part is not about the change. The middle part is talking about the type of work. So if you have an impact map where one of the impacts is detect miscategorized payments, your job is not done. Figure out how should that change. So the, the last important tip um, that I have for you is um, don't prevent people from breaking the structure as long as you have all these four elements. And um, what, what I mean by, by that, uh, oftentimes we've heard from people that, oh, you know, we started discussing the goal, but then there's all these constraints. Like we want to do this, but we don't want to create business risk, or we want to do this, but we have to be compliant with GDPR. Or we have to do this, but we cannot lose money on it and, and things like that. And um, they've struggled because there's no place on an impact map to put that. So they kind of uh, put that offline or postpone the discussion. Don't do that. Impact maps are really, really great to facilitate discussion. So figure out a way how to let people add additional context with still having these kind of four broad levels so that you discuss the impacts and the deliverables and the goals. And just as an example, kind of this is one potential way of doing it. I usually let people put bullet points under the goal, or you can kind of, you know, have a, a whole section under a goal. If you're doing a physical whiteboard, maybe create a box somewhere and let people put stickies for all the constraints and all the context that they want to have. And this makes sure that you've captured that information. It might not fit into kind of a, a nice, neat little hierarchy, like an impact map, but that's fine. It's still helping you with the discussions.
So um, that's kind of, you know, five really important facilitation tips I have for you. And uh, we can take questions now. Again, if, um, if you've used impact maps for good or for bad, and you want to contribute to the research, I would really, really appreciate it. Drop me an email, I will send you the link. So um, th th that's kind of uh, what I've prepared for you for today. I think we can take questions. Alberto, do you want to choose some questions? Excellent. Thanks, Goiko, uh, for your presentation. Um, so yeah, we do have one. Uh, I'll show it on the screen as well. So thanks, Christina. Uh, so if I have a predefined goal, let's say case three, why should I use impact mapping? It's not that I have any options. So it depends what that uh, predefined goal is. If the predefined goal is actually a good business goal, then you're really, really lucky. Then you're, you're, you're in a better situation than lots of organizations out there. If that goal is actually not a business goal, if that goal is uh, a deliverable, if that goal is an impact, for example, um, lots of organizations that have been influenced by uh, Lean UX and, and kind of UX design, um, they, they tend to have business goals that are actually really impact, something like um, increase customer retention or um, get people to, you know, get customers to switch to some platform or something like that. Those are behavior changes. Those are kind of um, short-term values rather than the kind of business goal. Um, and if you have a pre predefined, like replace the current solution business goal, that is actually a deliverable. The business goal is somewhere else. And uh, using impact mapping in that case can help you uncover the real business goal behind it. Um, we, I've done that a few times and we've uncovered that the real business goal is, for example, to reduce business risk or the real business goal is to reduce operational costs. And then when you have that context and you put some numbers against that, it can help you um, redefine the scope or reduce the scope or, or even if not reduce, create a sequence of delivering the scope so that you get the most value quickly. So in the case where it was about reducing business risk, we've identified, well, what part of the current product are creating the most business risk? Let's deliver that part on the new platform first so that we reduce the business risk first and then we can go and, and revisit this. Um, the other thing that impact mapping can help in that situation is actually connect this kind of all these deliverables to the goal so that you have this part in between where you have value in the middle and you can decide, well, you know, we've delivered this, we've delivered value, it's ready to go live. And you can keep track on your delivery. Excellent. So yeah, uh, Christina, let us know if that answers the question. I think she has a specification say, saying, I meant the situation to replace the current solution in hmm. three. I think, yeah, I think we've talked about this. So I think, okay. yeah. Brilliant. Right. Then we have George. Thanks, George. So do you have thoughts on the process of use or on the process or usefulness of impact mapping when the participants are remote versus collocated? Thanks, George. So th th that's a very good question, and I wish I had more data about this because, you know, for, for the last 10 years, I've been telling people, if you want to do this, you have to be in the same room, and then wow. Corona came. Remind and I think, me of uh, Alberto. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 then, and then, you know, the reality for many organizations now is they've understood that remote work is fine. I mean, you know, the, the world didn't collapse. And I think going forward, we're going to have a lot more of this kind of remote stuff going on. Now, um, I think... Uh, especially in the second context where uh, one person is leading the discussion really, but meeting with smaller groups across um, lo lots of different sessions, I think that could work very well remotely. Um, the first part with kind of focusing delivery and things like that, I, I, I really don't know. That, that's, a, that's an interesting thing to start looking at. I think um, having a clear goal prepared up front becomes even more important for um, remote work. And um, yeah, I, 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 I'm trying to collect more data about how people are doing impact mapping in a remote uh, fashion now, but I don't have anything solid for you yet. That's kind of specific to remote. 
Um, and I think, um, the, I don't think there's kind of a difference in usefulness where kind of people are remote or, or collocated. George was asking that specific question. So I think impact maps are useful because they help us align. Whether we're sitting in the same room or not, it doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, the, yeah, kind of facilitating impact mapping with a remote uh, kind of distribution is, is interesting and a tricky question that I don't know how to answer yet. But uh, you can uh, join us at the workshop we are doing in July because that's going to be actually one of... Um, we were chatting with Goiko before the meetup. I think it's like the seven or eight you've been doing. So there is some practice, of course, and we are happy to you know host this again because it was a very successful one when we used to do it uh, in person in Milan. But yeah, yeah, we had to change a lot, you know, with 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 going from an and maybe that's really that maybe that's relevant for kind of impact mapping as well. Going from a kind of in-person workshop to a remote workshop, I've, I've realized uh, parts have to be much smaller. Like we oh, instead of you know a a one-hour slot where we can discuss lots of different things, um, parts have to be like fifteen minutes, twenty minutes. There needs to be you know breaks need to be more frequent, and we need to make sure that. Everybody's yeah. kind of actually on the board. So George, type something else in. Let me see. Yeah, uh, I'll put it here. So yeah. I would think you would want I'm to put process exactly. around it. Yes, to make exactly. It. So so that's that's kind of as you know. As, uh, you're, you're completely right, George. I think one of my big lessons once you kind of started doing this remotely is you have to do it uh, much less ambitiously. So rather than you know half a day or a whole day, we started doing two and a half hours with longer breaks and and letting people um, do other things in between. Otherwise, they're, they're multitasking, they're reading email and things like that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely, yeah. Indeed, the workshop we are doing is two and a half hours over five days, whereas, of course, in person, they were one, two days, or it was yeah, a yeah, different yeah, exactly. thing. So, your friend, here we go, Dejan. Oh, damn, Dejan. excellent. How impact mapping has changed in these years? So uh -huh. I, I can tell you how I, uh, how my understanding of impact mapping changed. I can tell you also how the in-use impact mapping changed as well. Maybe there's a two different perspectives. So impact mapping comes from a Swedish interaction design agency called InUse. Um, they, they originally uh, kind of synthesized this method as a way of helping them work with very large clients and figuring out where is the value of what they're delivering and, and how they're organizing it. And... Um, most of their work, at least that's my understanding, was on planning a larger initiative. It wasn't on working through with the developers or through the delivery. And um, the way they're using impact maps, or at least when we spoke with them uh, about two years ago, changed so their impact maps now only have three levels. Rather than having four levels, they've decided to group the impact and the actor in the same kind of level so that... In effect, um, th there is no more jump between business goal to impact. Business goal um, and, and impact are directly connected. I think that can uh, be an interesting situation, especially kind of given the tip I've, I've mentioned where um, skip the actors and then work on the impacts and then group them into impacts. I um, My... Uh, kind of um, experience is that if you're actually working on, on iterative delivery, having the level of actors explicitly there is useful for prioritization. Because when we're thinking about some specific thing, we can say, let's focus on large enterprise customers first, and then we're going to focus on small and medium enterprises. And at that level of prioritization, then I don't even have to look at all the deliverables or the stuff or that. So it's useful to have that level rather than have it all kind of broken up into, into details. So that, that's one potential way how, how this has changed. Um, the, the way kind of um, it's changed for me, I've understood a lot more kind of a lot wider context about this, especially with this research, because I usually work with people who do very frequent delivery um, and I'm using impact mapping for my products where we, you know, sometimes releasing multiple times a day and we are very flexible with the goals and impacts and, and we can uh, identify that very easily. But starting to this research, I realized that actually this high level alignment might be 
um, uh, where m most people get the most value. No, no, not act, not low level tracking and figuring out what do we do next and what do we prioritize, but just kind of high level alignment on what should we even do. Um, that ends up being incredibly useful and it was really, really impact maps uh, seem to be really useful for that purpose uh, where it doesn't really translate to a backlog. It doesn't translate to kind of uh, anything apart from this, you know, five senior stakeholders actually agreed on a plan on a very high level. And then that plan turns into, I don't know, user story map, a uh, Word document or something else, and they throw the map away. So that, that, that was my kind of surprising uh, understanding. Cool. Thanks, Goiko. We have other two for now. Let's see if something else comes up. We have Christian. Hi, Christian. Thanks for that. So avoiding premature solutionizing by not inviting people, producing deliverables sounds good, but getting perspective from people producing deliverables also sounds good. How to get both? So I, um, my preference, and uh, until we started doing this research, you know, I was very, very strongly in favor of getting senior developers, senior technical people in the room when, when uh, Impact Map is done exactly because of that. So you don't necessarily want everybody, but you want somebody senior there who can say like, this particular thing uh, is uh, seven men millennia of work. This particular thing is one week of work. They achieve the same fucking thing. So, you know, let's do this. And um, th th that's incredibly useful. But in a case where people really want to clarify what the goal is, um, we've heard several cases where, like, not having not having uh, developers in the room actually helped people have a freer discussion. And the way they got perspective from uh, people producing deliverables is that this kind of uh, middle of the map then kind of became a request for a proposal. So. Um, while you know there were no de de people delivering their present to discuss deliverables, it also helped kind of keep the discussion high level. That didn't mean we're never going to talk about deliverables, just not at that session. So then there's you know you, you you send that to developers, architects, they come up with a proposal, and then you have another session later to discuss options. And that's kind of another really interesting part of a hierarchy is you end up basically proposing multiple options for each of these requests. So if you have a map that has um, uh, users, you know, users in Italy on mobile devices need to complete the purchase 20% faster or something like that as an impact, then uh, the people doing delivery can then respond to that with two or three options. And they, we can then discuss that. So th that's kind of how I would suggest using that as a separate session. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Uh, let's move on to uh, 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 Benjamin. Thanks, Benjamin. So if you are developing, for example, a cash cashless payment card reader, then the deliverable is predefined. It's a card reader. Would the, an impact mapping still make sense? Oh, I, I don't know. That depends whether you know what the goals are for the card reader, whether you know which features you want to launch and how, whether you want to uh, prove that certain features of the card reader are more or less important for certain markets. Um, if you don't really know what the objective of that is, or if there's too many objectives and you want to figure out the right priorities, then impact mapping might help. Um, because it can help kind of flush out that. Uh, one of the best um, metaphors I have for people like this uh, in a situation where you're working with stakeholders and, and you know, they know the solution is that although the solution you know, at the end can always be the same, the sequence of delivery can make a big difference. You know, doing this thing first and then doing this thing first might allow you to benefit from this thing six months earlier. Or doing this thing first and then doing this thing might allow you to um, de-risk certain things that can be really problematic later. And in cases like that, um, the, the, the kind of joke I like to use is called Christmas prioritization. It comes from a, a, an abuse of my friend Chris Matz's name because he was propagating um, now or not now, or, or yes and yes, but later prioritization. 
And that's all about the sequence, effectively. And I was talking about this in, in Singapore a few years ago, and there was a question of the audience from the audience, with, you know, my broken English and their broken English kind of intersected. And a, a lady from the audience said, you know, can you repeat what you said about this Christmas prioritization? And I was talking about Christmas prioritization. And I said, well, you know, that's, it's not called like that, but that's a brilliant name. I'll, I'll steal that. And now I tell people, like, you know, in this card reader, you have five potential presents. Now, you can wait until the end of the whole thing to open up all five presents. Or you can choose one of those presents to open next month. And then what we need to do is we need to create like a, a sequence of Christmases, a prioritization of Christmases so that we always open up an interesting present. And this becomes kind of uh, potentially useful there. So if the card reader is supposed to, you know, contribute to several business goals, deliver several impacts, doing an impact map might help you have the discussion about sequence. Uh, cool. Sorry, I was uh, looking for the blog post where you talk about this in detail, and I found it. Uh, cool. Uh, right. So we have another one from Matteo. Thanks, Matteo. So if you attend a conversation with people discussing goals at a high level with no mention of behavior changes, do you think it might be useful to drop some questions to help them think of impact? So I think this is a, a de depending on what, like you're actually trying to do. I think uh, I've mentioned in focusing delivery, it's really useful to have a full up upfront agreement on a goal. So if I'm facilitating a session with senior stakeholders who have decided we're going to have a full, like you know, the output of this needs to be an agreement on the goal, and we only have you know one afternoon or something like that. Um, I would try to steer the conversation towards the goals, not the impacts. I, I might, uh, as I said, you know, ask some questions like, um, how is this useful or what would be a good indicator that we're delivering or how would we know we need to replan? And I have this technique uh, for kind of structuring the discussion where I draw up a table on, on a big whiteboard or a spreadsheet online. And then I get people to think about how would you know that you failed at the end? So, uh, you know, if, if we start delivering now and a year from now or two years from now, how would you know that we failed? And in my experience, it's much easier for people to think about how you, failure modes than what success is. Because, um, you know, they might talk about 20% uh, this, 30% that, millions, billions, whatever to, to their goals. But we can say, look, if in six months time we've not increased revenue by at least 10%, we've not delivered anything of value. We, we spent too much money delivering or, or things like that. And then I identify five or six of these high-level things. Then I cut the kind of uh, table in half. And I say, okay, this is going to be six months from now. How about three months from now? How, you know, knowing that these are the numbers we need to kind of hit at least six months from now, they're not going to stay flat like this market share is not going to stay flat until the last day of the six months and then jump 20%. Like, how would we know three months from now that we're not, we need to replan, that we, we're not delivering, and then cut it again to a month. That helps to uh, discuss um, this uh, uh, kind of, th the goals stuff, at least. So I would suggest doing that more than behavior changes in particular, but if you're doing an impact mapping session, people are talking about the goals all the time, of course, navigate towards impacts. Cool. Uh, I don't know if you managed to see the second, I think it's the second part of the question. The situation is one where they don't know about impact mapping. If yes, at which level would you stop? So I would, if, if we're preparing a goal, I would kind of look at whatever metrics they tell me that they are kind of, how would you, how would you know they failed? Um, and then I would use these then to group into higher level stuff, and some of these will remain impact, some of these will kind of um, be higher level business goals, and then I would restructure that before an impact mapping session. If I'm actually doing impact mapping with people, then uh, of, you know, I, would, I would try to get them to give me examples of how a deliverable would change somebody's behavior, why would it be useful, and for a goal, I would kind of navigate down saying, okay, what are some leading indicators that we can measure that we're actually going towards that goal How, who can help us who can obstruct us and things like that excellent so um thanks goiko 
was very dense and uh, informative. So I guess if we don't have any more questions, we have like a five, 10 seconds delay, but we've given plenty of time. Um, so one last thing I wanted to show very quickly, but just so you know where to find us. Ah, we have Dejan, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So let me stop this. So uh, next month, well, not next month, actually. Uh, oh, look, we are here. <laughs> we are live, but we're here as well. So we're doing the workshop with Goiko. It's basically the remote version split into five modules of what used to be the product owner key skills or impact mapping workshop. Um, come along. It's basically uh, guaranteed to run. We have reached the minimum numbers. So um, should be a safe investment on your side. Um, so we can learn more about all the things that Goiko has touched upon today. Uh, we close with one last question from Dejan. Should impacts be expressed as OKRs? So that's a very interesting question. And we, we heard a couple of case studies now, you know, as OKRs are becoming more popular, people mixing OKRs and impact maps. Um, my uh, best guess from the stories we've heard and from what I know about OKRs is that on some level, they fit very nicely. Uh, OKRs tend to be hierarchical. So we have uh, an objective for a department and then some key results that need to be achieved for that objective. And then that key result becomes kind of an objective for a lower level thing and it breaks down even more. So at some level, kind of the, the goal of an impact map um, and, and for me, the best uh, types of goals on impact maps are goals for a milestone of a software kind of uh, initiative. So something that's, you know, three months, six months, not something that's years and not something that's, we, we, you know, a few weeks. So at some point that starts becoming one of the key results on the whole kind of OKR hierarchy, and that becomes the goal. And um, using that as an objective, then the impacts really should be the key results that map to that objective. And, and on that level, it works brilliantly. But then kind of as you go down uh, and these impacts become themselves kind of higher level objectives, then the key results for achieving these impacts actually become deliverable. So I think an impact map is kind of like a, a projection of a fully developed OKR hierarchy. And it can fit very nicely into that, especially because key results need to be measurable and, and key results need to be evaluated and an objective can be more lofty in certain cases. So I think that there's, a, there's a big intersection between uh, describing OKRs and, uh, and impact maps. And uh, it's really useful to think about impacts as key results that would lead to an objective. I think it's the best closing. So uh, it's a very nice one, connecting OKRs and impact mapping. So, um, well, with this, uh, we thank you for being with us. Uh, Goiko, anything else you want to say as a closing? No, note? thank you. Thank you very much to everybody who attended. Um, thank you, Dan, for all the, all the good questions and everybody else. See you next time. Absolutely. So thank you all. Uh, see you either at next meetup or at Goiko's workshop, which is taking place next month, uh, in two months. And uh, well, thanks a lot. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.